Hello and welcome to the Biopharma Finder 2.0 example guide on how to process intact analysis. In this example, I'm going to demonstrate how to process some native uh, raw files that were uh, processed for the first septum molecule. And um, there's going to be 10 different raw files. And I'm going to show you how we can do um, multi um, file comparison in the new software. So here's the home page for Biopharma Finder 2.0. And we're going to begin with Protein Sequence Manager. Now I've already imported in the protein sequence to save time, but I can show you, we'll go over this just um, quickly, uh, for what you need for the intact analysis. So when you bring in your protein sequence for an intact analysis, you want to make sure that you have the appropriate number of chains for antibodies. So here we have one copy of the light chain, and we have two copies of, um, here's another copy of the light chain. And then you'll have two copies of the heavy chain. You need to link the disulfide bonds together, and when you do that, you uh, click on a cysteine, and you can create a link, uh, bridge the link, or remove the link, as I've, I've already linked them together. Here you can see the red lines. By doing this, you're actually reducing the mass of the intact protein. Now, when the software does the annotation for intact, the target protein mass, the two values you see right here, must be close to what the protein that you're interested in, minus any variable modifications. So if we did not link these 16 disulfide bonds, the mass that you see here would be heavy by 32, because when you link the disulfide bonds, you will be removing two protons, two hydrogens, sorry. Uh, so, therefore, you need to make sure that you link the appropriate disulfide bonds if it's non-reduced, and then you get the um, average uh, mass for the target protein um, is what the non-modified version is. Now, this is not required for peptide mapping. You do not need to have four copies of the protein sequence, and you do not need to link the disulfide bonds. Again, for peptide mapping, that is not required. Okay, so once we have this, um, you can see we have everything linked. Now, if I needed to add um, a modification to the uh, termini here, I could just double click. In this example, I don't, but if it was a Q for, or Q for example, I could do the uh, pyroglue modification uh, by double clicking on, on that residue. But in this case, I don't have any static modifications in this sequence. I can look at the variable bonds, and you can slide this over. And here you'll see um, N-terminal modifications, Z-terminal modifications, side chain modifications. And please pay attention to this little scroll bar because it's actually going to show you where the N-glycan uh, database is. So what I have shown here in this sequence is I created, and you'll see them in purple, different um, glycans that I'd actually look at. And these are uh, combinations. So I have a G0, G0F, and you can see the masses here, the uh, monomass and the average mass, and it's going to be on the N. And the N, it's this N that often gets modified in uh, this protein sequence. And so um, I can just add each one of these as a uh, variable modification. So I'm, I'm actually looking for this combination. Now, you can do this when you want to have a targeted search. So if you know that these six glycans should be in your molecule, you want to do a quick analysis and say, are they there? You can add them um, as variable mods. And then you can save this. So what I often do is I say the protein name, and then I say variable, and then I say, okay, so I'm going to overwrite because I already have it in my database. Now your other option can be, too, if you want to expand the um, glycans, and see what other combinations are there. I'm going to remove all of these, and I'm going to turn them on Cho. When I do Cho, I will put um, Cho up here so I know. And then I add intact for my category as well. So then I can hit Save. Now I have both types of sequences that I can actually search um, for my deconvoluted results. OK, so let's cancel out. So you'll see here the variable. And um, whoops, I left the. Uh, Let's, let's fix that. So I have a little error there. Let's get rid of that variable. There we go. Okay, so we'll just save that. Cancel. Okay, and then if I want to remove this one, I could just click and hit delete so I could keep my database nice and clean. 
Okay, so we have our two protein sequences. Now let's go back to the home. We're going to go to the intact home page. Now this intact home page may look similar to the peptide mapping. Um, we've redone this entire workflow, so I hope that you uh, find this um, much easier to use. So let's go ahead and um, name my experiment. And I'm going to call this home page. And then I can browse for my raw files. And my files are here. So in this case, I have 10 raw files. And it's 10 files of just the same injected um, protein. And so um, once I have the raw files in, I can assign conditions. And in this example, I'm going to assign the same condition because these are uh, replicate injections. So I can actually look at the CV calculation for these to see how reproducible my experiment was. I'm going to do a multi-consensus. And what this is, is each one of the files uh, will be processed individually. The decomposition is done on each individual file. And then the results are merged together into one single result file. Your other option would be batch processing. In that case, each file would be processed and the results would be kept separate. So empty consensus is brand new to this version and I hope you uh, find this extremely useful for comparing across multiple samples. Okay, let's just start with the simplest version first. Let's start with the variables. And uh, to select the processing method, what I often do is um, first you could use the filters. So I'm gonna, this is native mass, uh, mass spec data. So I need to use the respect algorithm. So I'm just going to start to type respect in there. And so these are all my respect algorithm um, processing methods. Now I have different choices of how I would like to create the source spectrum. And so um, if you look at this, and let's just look at the defaults. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to contains that I can put defaults here. And these are the different default methods that I have. So I know this is native, so I'm going to just select the native um, default method. In this uh, video, I'm going to not edit the method, but I'm going to go into manual processing and show you how I process the data, um, which I often do in manual in a manual mode. You could, after you fine-tune the processing method and you have everything, all the parameters exactly like you'd like, you can save that processing method and go back and add, um, add it to here and then add it to a, the queue so you can run it kind of in an in automated way. So once you fine-tune fine the method, and if you have new data files you'd like to process, you can just select them and go, and it'll add it to the queue. Uh, but for this example, we're going to show how to do manual processing. So if I click manual, the software is going to go through and read all the raw files. Okay, and now we're in the process and review. And so I'm going to actually minimize this so you can see better. And if you look, these are all the chromatograms that we just, um, for all the 10 files. That we just processed, that we just selected. Okay, so this is chromatogram, deconvolution, source spectrum, and results. Now, this real-time optimization is all the parameters that you need uh, to process the data. So we have everything all in one place. We have our component detection. So, so when I think of component detection, that contains um, chromatogram parameters. It also contains your source spectrum, because the first step of this process is create your source spectrum. The second step of the process is do the deconvolution. Okay, so this create your source spectrum, which can be a mass over a certain time window, or it could be a single scan, um, but most likely it's going to be an average over a certain time window. And then um, you're going to create that source spectrum, then you're going to deconvolute it. And so these are your deconvolution parameters. So let's go back. Um, first, let, let's take a look at the source, uh, source spectrum creation and chromatogram. And in this example, I selected the um, average over RT. And all that is, is if I click on, a, on the chromatogram, you're going to see the source spectrum over here are generated. And so now you see all the different source spectrum from all the different files. Now, this is a single scan, so I wouldn't want to process a single scan, but I can just drag my mouse and create an average scan. There are two modes on the chromatogram, so it's important that you pay attention to which mode you're in. I'm in averaging now, but if I want to zoom in, I can change my mode and now I can zoom. And I can go back to average if I want to change the actual source spectrum that I created. So the next, the first place I start with is the mass range. 
range. So this mass range is um, for the chromatogram and for the deconvolution. So it is a deconvolution parameter. These windows are floatable, so I have to bring this one out so I can see better. Um, and in this case, uh, actually, let me expand this out so you can see. So there's also this peak right here. And this peak is actually the salt peak um, that, that eludes also, that eludes as well. And so we're not going to be interested in looking at that. And I wanted to just point this out so you can see how the chromatograms change whenever I actually change the, um, the MZ range for this. So let's go back and average across where our molecules eluding. And you'll notice this is native. So everything's a little bit higher, not as much charge. So if it was um, reduced, the, the um, charge states, the nice type of envelopes would be down here, more towards um, 2500, uh, but now we're up here because we're native. And so I'm just going to kind of zoom in and see if I can select a, a narrower mass range that, that gives us some good results. So I think I'm going to use 5000, and if you watch what happens, this is going to go away. See, salt's gone because it, we're looking at something above 5000. And let's say 6,300. Okay, so that's that. Now, the way um, you select the retention time, what I, I just saw you, you have two options. You can just drag your mouse, and it'll average. And it also enters the times here so that you can, this is allowing you to be more reproducible. Or you can just type it in yourself, and the um, window will update uh, based on what you type in. Okay, so you can do it either way. So now that we have our uh, source spectrum, and we like uh, the source spectrum that we've able to, that we've created, all of the files look good. That's one thing you want to check. Make sure all of them have good source spectrum. If they don't, you need to check your uh, this parameter and, and also check your time parameter to make sure that that's appropriate for that for your raw files that you're processing. And uh, now let's go to the deconvolution. We're doing respect. Now, uh, the first place I start is the model mass range. And this um, mass range should be around uh, the molecule that we're interested in, if, if you know what the molecular weight is. And you could, so that kind of goes along with the target mass. So the target mass, um, I can leave this set to 150,000. I think the protein's around 148,000. The 150,000 should be fine. And um, I'm not expecting to have any dimers in this example, so I'm going to set this to 160,000 for my upper uh, limit, and then I'm going to set this to 140,000 for my lower limit. Now, the um, most important uh, second parameter to change, especially for native, is the minimum adjacent charges. And uh, because we're looking at native, we don't have as many charges. We want to make sure um, that this, these values are set appropriately. So if you process using the default value, you do not get results, or the results do not um, look good. Let's go ahead and process it and see what actually happens. Now, sometimes if you have this set um, using the defaults, you won't get any results at all. So in this case, we are actually getting some, some results, so it's OK. Now, you can, the way these work, uh, I just want to um, explain this because this is quite important. Uh, the four, so this is four um, minimum adjacent charges. So that would mean that you have to have, um, let's say that we're looking at charge uh, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. So that would be, we need to have a minimum of four at mass to charge, um, or at mass 140,000. Okay, so, so this one is related to this one. This one is related to this one. Okay, so that's a pretty wide spread I set here. I'm going to require 10 charges at 160,000 and only 4 at 140,000. So maybe I could set that to where they're more similar uh, because the masses are not that much different, the range I'm not looking at. So then I'll go ahead and reprocess. One thing that I really like about this new version is that you can adjust your parameters and just process on the fly, just like that. Um, there's no issues in doing that, and, and you can um, quickly assess uh, how the parameter changes, in fact, impact your results. Now, one thing is the software does not save the results until you save it. So let's say that, that this looks pretty good, um, and I don't want to make any changes, or I want to capture um, what I have here, so save your results. So it'll use your experiment name, and you can say, OK. So now it's saved um, this result file, and then I can also save my uh, method. 
Okay, so that way I capture what I have. And what you'll see is, um, again, we see the, the um, chromatograms. These are the source spectrum, but this is what we were looking for. So let's pop this out. And so here are our deconvoluted results. And so you can see this is for all of the files. And you can zoom in. You can copy this. So you can actually copy this and paste this into um, PowerPoint. And it will paste all 10 so that you can actually see them. You can zoom in a little closer. And you can look at each one of the files. So you can see there is a little bit of variation um, in the width. And as you click on the different components, it's going to move the blue line. So now we're looking at uh, one of the other glycoforms. So you can kind of zoom up and zoom down. So this is where the floating windows um, become very helpful in assessing your data. The same is true uh, for the source spectrum. Uh, so you can zoom in and you can see uh, the source spectrum as well. So uh, very handy. Uh, now one thing, let's look at the table. So the table is much improved um, from the previous version of the software, and I hope you, you find that as well. Um, let's click on the most abundant, so this is 100%. And what you're looking at is um, we're at the component level. If we expand this, you're at the individual raw file level. And if you expand that, you're at the individual charge state level. Okay, so, so you want to look at these different levels. This is the protein name. This is the modification. So this is our glycoform mass. Um, every time that we're pulling together multiple uh, results from multiple fly files, we're going to tell you how the calculation was done. So in this case, it was an average. And the value you see here is the mean of all of the files. Now, when we merge together results, um, we have to have some parameters to allow us to do that. So the multi-consensus component merger parameters, and I'm under the identification, so real-time optimization, identification, multi-consensus component merge. Because if you remember, each one of these was basically processed individually. And then we had to take all of these and pull them together to be one. So if you did this in Excel, you think about how you would actually do that. You're going to have some mass tolerance um, that you're going to allow and then you're going to have some type of time tolerance that you're going to allow. And in this case, we don't really have time because we just have one single source spectrum. Um, so that's our time range. So the time is not really relevant here, but the mass is. And so all of these masses are within a 10 ppm window. And so um, we, we average, take the average mass, which is what you get here, and then we're calculating the um, percent CV for that uh, for that average. So you can you can actually see um, what the variation is. All right, so um, we give you a theoretical mass uh, for the modification, uh, that form of the molecule. This is new to the software. We're giving you the matched error um, and the CV also, relative abundance, fractional abundance, scoring. This is new um, number of files observed. And so this is how many files did you actually see this component in? And so that's, um, in this case, we see it in all 10. And when you expand, you can see that. Um, and here's your um, intensity. We have the CV. And um, this is for the specific group. So if you remember, um, or the condition. So if you remember back at the beginning, I assigned a condition for each for the data set. And so in this case, I just assigned it all as the same condition, because these were just technical um, injections. If it was different conditions. I could do control, stress, whatever, and you would actually get the individual intensities, CVs, and number of files per the different conditions. So that's really allows you to do a true comparison um, across the different raw files. Now, when we look at the raw file level, um, the information is a little bit um, different. And what I like is this charge state distribution. So this is new. So you can actually see. We see the number of charges, but we see the range of the charge state. So we saw 24 to 29. So that's kind of useful um, when you're starting to look, go through and look at your data. Now, let me show you um, when you click on an individual. So we have component level, we see everything. And then you can see the individual um, charge states down here, okay, or the individual raw files, sorry. Now, if you. Um, turn on the XIC, which I didn't turn it on. So I can turn that on, and I'm going to reprocess it. 
you actually uh, see the XIC as well uh, for each um, of the individual components, and you'll see that at the raw file level. So let's, um, let's see how that worked. See, it's pretty quick when you, when you make changes. Okay, so there you go. So let me open this up a little bit so you can see better. And so now you're seeing, um, this is the uh, base fee for that individual file, and then here's the tick. Now the tick is just the trace, um, and when we're calculating the intensity, that's not actually coming from the trace, it's just more of an image. Um, you can kind of see, oops, sorry. So you can kind of see how, um, how the uh, molecule eluded. Now what I just did was I clicked in here and I tried to average. If you do that, and I have the mode on averaging, it thinks I want to create a new source spectrum. So if I want to zoom, you got to remember to click here. It's kind of like that little um, pin push and call browser that drives everybody crazy. Um, but once you get the hang of it, uh, hopefully it won't, it won't be too bad. Um, so to zoom out, you can just do that, right click and you'll zoom out. Okay, so let's look at actually how we did. So um, let's click here. So uh, it looks like this one, so this is one of the glycoforms that I expect to find. And if we zoom in, you can kind of see it. For some reason, we're not getting it. Um, and so we know that we should actually be identifying that glycoform. And for some reason, we're not. So what do you do? Well, what I'm going to do, and, and I find that um, this happens a little bit often, is that sometimes the 20 ppm for the mass um, sequence match tolerance is a little bit too high and, and for specific glycoforms, especially when they get kind of low. So if I increase this to 25 and I hit uh, reprocess, let's see if that other glycoform uh, will show up. And I think it's just outside of the um, 20 ppm window. Okay, so now just by changing our uh, sequence mass tolerance from 20 to 25, now we actually see uh, the other glycoform. So it was actually a match tolerance of uh, 23. So one other thing I want to show you in this example is if we click here and we want to take this deconvoluted spectrum and let's say that here it is and this is for our file 7, we want to add it to the library. So here you can see file 7 and you can hit OK. And then let's pick file 11. We can also add it to our library. And now if you go to the spectral comparison, you can actually compare those files. And see, I have, I have some other ones in here. So I can click on one, click on the other one, and now I have the mirror plots. And you can kind of zoom in, and you can see how they differ from file to file. Okay. Now, it'll also tell us the details. So you want to make sure when you're doing the comparison that the data was processed using the same method. Okay. So the parameters can really impact your results. And you want to always make sure that um, the same methods were used whenever you're doing a comparison. You can also export out these results uh, to Excel uh, just by right-clicking on the table. Uh, one more thing I want to show you how easily it is to switch over to sliding window. Okay, so now we just averaged across this peak, created one simple source spectrum, but we could also try sliding window for this. So I'm going to click uh, the source spectrum method to sliding window. I'm going to scooch this down a little bit. And remember, save your results if you want to keep this before you change. So I'm going to zoom in. And I'm going to set my retention time range for my sliding window. So let's set this to 3.9 to 5.0. And for this, I'm just going to use the default settings. So what's going to happen once this starts going is, and you can watch it go real time, it's going really quick. So the red box represents the sliding window. The width of the red box is the width of the window. And you'll notice it has an offset. Each window creates an average a source spectrum. That source spectrum gets deconvoluted. The deconvoluted results, so there's a whole bunch of windows across each raw file. They get merged together into a result file. Okay, so that's what we actually just saw happen really quickly. So now we see the sliding window results. So one advantage of sliding window is if you go to the raw file level and you click, 
you're going to see the abundance traces. And you can see the abundance trace for each file very quickly. And you can see how reproducible it is. Now, in this case, the abundance trace is kind of not starting right here. So then we can fine tune our parameters. We can say, and you can play around with this, and it's really easy to do now. So what I might want to do is, let's say, let's start a little bit earlier. I'm going to make my window size a little bit smaller, and I'm going to set the offset to 1. Now, when I do that and I hit process, a dialog box is going to pop up with some recommended offset, and I want it to run with that. So now it's going through and it's creating a source spectrum for each window. Then it's doing a deconvolution of that source spectrum, and you're going to have a whole bunch. So for each raw file, you'll have a whole bunch of deconvoluted spectrum across the chromatogram or across that retention time window. It's going to merge those together. And so that's these parameters. This is how we define our window. This is how we define merging the values together. And it does that for each file. Okay, you'll notice in this animation, the window's a lot smaller. Okay, so this, the window size, because we changed, we went from 0.5 to 0.1. So the width of the window is a lot smaller. And I think it changed the offset from 25% to 29%. And so let's just see how that looks. And so these are some ways that you can improve. A sliding window works really well if you have multiple components in your uh, sample. So if you have a complex mixture like an ABC sample, or if you have um, subunit analysis, so you have, uh, you've done IDES uh, digest. And if you go on to our uh, Plexera website, you'll be able to find um, an example data set for the IDES digest where you could actually try the sliding window. Okay, so let's see how this looks now. Okay, so we can expand. Oops, let's expand that out. And now you can click. So that looks a little bit more like a chromatographic peak. I kind of like that a little bit better. But we just got that by, um, you know, reducing our window time and um, changing our offset. So what I really like about this is that you can really see um, quickly uh, your results from multiple files. And in the past um, software, you wouldn't have been able to do that. One thing um, that you could do is you can see if they're shifting in the actual glycoform. Let's see if I can find the same raw file. So if you look at five and then five, so there's a little bit of a shift. Those are kind of similar. But if you can really see the shift with, um, with ABCs. You can really see how, even though it looks like one big blob, the different forms of the molecules are actually eluding um, chromatographically a little bit. Okay, well, great. I hope this was um, a good example of how uh, you can process a native data set. Um, this is a multi-consensus uh, multi experiment uh, using our software, our 2.0 BioPharma Finder software. Thank you.